One of the companions who has a story that is particularly relevant to our day and age. And it's relevant because we live in a time of affluence. We live in a time, no matter what financial difficulty we may or may not encounter on a micro level, at a macro level, on a wide level, all of us experience, alhamdulillah, the benefit of living in a society that has lots of privilege that we expect that when we plug our phone charger into a wall socket, that there will be electricity, that we expect that when we turn on the faucet here at the ISBCC, that there will be water. These are privileges, not rights. And these are things that we take for granted sometimes and we forget that not every human being on earth has these same privileges. And so Mus'ab bin Umair radiallahu an is a story of a young man who grew up with this affluence, if I could make an analogy that does not have any other connection besides their wealth, Mus'ab bin Umair was like the Kardashian boy of the time. Literally, there is no other connection to them besides their wealth. I guarantee you that. Mus'ab bin Umair radiallahu an was somebody who the Quraysh, the Jahili Quraysh, the people who were trying to hurt the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they loved Mus'ab bin Umair for a few reasons. Number one was because he was extremely handsome. He was somebody that had just this, this confidence in his physical image that when he walked in the street, they would say that sometimes women would line up along his daily route just to see him, right? I know some of you guys in here are thinking that happens to you too. No, it doesn't, right? Mus'ab bin Omer is special. He had that. Mus'ab bin Omer, he had a fragrance, subhanAllah, that they said that you could smell him from blocks away. He smelled so good. He was so wealthy, his family was so wealthy. Khunnas bin Malik was his wife's name, Khunnas bin Malik. Or he's not his wife, I'm sorry, his mother. She was so wealthy and so powerful that he got all of his clothes tailored. He got all of his clothes custom made. You know, it's one thing to be able to shop for expensive clothing, to buy nice clothing. That's one thing, right? A lot of us don't even have that ability where we can go and buy like brand name, you know, random undershirts and things like that. No, we have to, you know, cut our costs, make our budget. It's life, alhamdulillah. But some people, they're able to afford very expensive brand names off, they can go to very expensive stores. But there's another level beyond that of opulence, of wealth, where there is no brand name on the clothes. There is nothing on the clothes, just a number that the tailor had stitched because having a, someone's clothes custom made is a sign of extreme wealth. That you get everything fit to your body exactly. And this was Mus'ab bin Umair. And one note that they write in the book, SubhanAllah of Tariq of History, is that he used to have his shoes. Not, you know, some people say, okay, get your clothes custom made, but just buy your shoes, right? Be a normal person, buy some shoes. No, even his shoes were custom made and they were sent from Yemen all the way from Yemen, which at the time was a sign of extreme wealth. So Mus'ab Musa bin Omer, in summary, had a lot going on. And he was somebody that if you met him today, if you met his circumstance today, you might consider somebody with his circumstances to be spoiled. To be somebody who wouldn't take life seriously because their dad bought them a Mercedes or a BMW and they don't have to care about anything. They're just going to school for the sake of it and whatnot. But Mus'ab bin Umair had a very unique personality trait. And that was that he didn't let his wealth, he didn't let it take over his heart. He didn't let it blind him. You know, SubhanAllah, the dunya has this amazingly tricky capability that the more that you chase it, the more it makes you want it. And the Prophet Muhammad said in the hadith that nothing will satisfy the children of Adam, the sons and daughters of Adam, i.e. human beings, nothing will satisfy them except for dirt, i.e. al-qabr, the grave. Because we will keep chasing and chasing and chasing. And you may see this in your own life, that you say to yourself, okay, after this raise, I'm gonna stop focusing on work so much, I'm gonna start coming home on time, spending time with my family. After I buy this car, no more new cars. We're gonna drive them until they until they break down. After this house, there's no need. We're going to settle. We're going to pay it off. After this, after this. But the reality is that insan also shares the same root as the word nisyan. Human beings share the same root as the word forgetful. And so we are forgetful people. We forget that we make these promises and we keep chasing dunya, 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 and our hearts become absorbed in it. Musa bin Umar didn't have that issue. 
So Musa bin Omer is surrounded by this wealth, this opulence, this lavishness, and he was extremely smart, he was privileged, he was able to take part in the meetings of Quraysh, and he hears about this group of people in his city, in Mecca, and they're meeting at a house, the house of Arqam, Dar al-Arqam. And he says that, you know, he's told or he hears these whispers that they're listening to this new religion, that they're their colleague, their you know, neighbor, Muhammad ibn Abdullah that he's bringing to them. And this is the first lesson that we take from Musa ibn Umair. That when he hears this, and he hears that people's lives are changing, and he hears that they are becoming different, they're transforming into something better. He takes the initiative and he goes and he meets with the Prophet Muhammad and the companions in Dar al-Arqam. You know, sometimes we like to think that we will do something later, right? Procrastinators unite tomorrow. That's what they say. But the reality is that if you don't take initiative to capitalize on something, the heart is something that easily flips. And so if your heart is presented with the opportunity to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jump on it. Don't let it sit. Don't say that when I get older, I'll do this. When I have my friends with me, we'll go together. If you feel in your heart, an inspiration to do something that's going to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then don't wait, don't let it die, don't let that candle burn out. Capitalize on that moment. That's what Musa bin Umair did. He didn't say, well, let me enjoy my life first. I'm so rich and young. I have so many years ahead of me. Let me go ahead and take advantage. He didn't say, I don't want to go alone. It's weird going alone. Let me get some friends first, make sure the place is safe. No, he said, you know what? This message sounds good. I want to go hear about it. See, one of the things we talk about with people getting active, what you forget, is that it's rare for someone who eats too much, sleeps too much, plays too many games to suddenly wake up one day and say, I'm missing something. It's not going to happen. You have to begin to deprive yourself of some things in life to be able to see what is the need that I can fulfill. And he turns around and he finds out, wow, there's this group getting together, the young and the old, the weak among them. And they're being moved by this message that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is giving. And suddenly you start to realize that he is the one that takes the initiative. One of the days in the night, he decided to go tiptoeing to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam. And he knocked on the door. A soft knock was heard on the door. When they opened the door, they found Mus'ab ibn Umair, this teenager, one of the wealthiest in Mecca, the children of one of the wealthiest in Mecca. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were so delighted. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was happy. They welcomed him in. He sat down. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not cut his speech. He continued talking. On that eve, he was talking about the fire and Jahannam and life after death and how people will either go into heaven or hell depending on the deeds that they have done in their lifetime. And Musa ibn Umair heard all this and he heard several verses of the Quran being recited. It touched his heart and he knew that what my people are doing is absolutely wrong. They fight with each other. They are killing each other. They are worshipping stones and sticks and they have a lot of superstitious beliefs so Musa ibn Umair declared his faith to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abi Al-Arqam which is also another notable characteristic that sometimes we hear things that we know are good for us we know are right but our nafs fights it off and we don't want to accept it because we might think of some other temporary benefit that we can have by ignoring the deen. But wallahi, brothers and sisters, anything that the deen says to do is good for you, protects you and I from harm, protects us from poison. And anything that our nafs commands us to, if it goes against the deen, it's going to hurt us. It's going to hurt us in the long run. So Musa bin Umair, he hears this message, his heart is inclined towards it, and he capitalizes on it right away. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. He accepts Islam. And young people, when they become very passionate about something, they want to tell the world, right? They want to tell everybody. And Musa bin Omer, he's in a very interesting situation where his mother is one of the most powerful women of Quraysh. And if she finds out that he's Muslim, there's going to be some bad news for Musa. And so he talks about it with the Prophet Muhammad He makes shura. 
and they discover and they decide together that maybe it's best to keep your faith hidden for now. Maybe it's best not to announce to everybody because you don't want to rock the boat too much. And this teaches us that it's good to have wisdom when we deal with people. You know, sometimes we think, brother, this is the haq. We have to tell everybody. Tell them right to their face. Don't be shy. No hayat in knowledge. Look at why the Prophet Muhammad told him, be quiet about it for now. Ya ghulam, oh young man, be quiet about it for now. Why? You don't want to shake things up too much. Because one of the predominant characteristics of the believers is hikmah, is wisdom, is knowing how to talk to people in what way and in what amount. That's hikmah. And so Musa ibn Umar, he keeps it quiet. Every night, just like the others, he used to tiptoe out of his home and he used to go to the house of Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam radiallahu anh, where they used to meet with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and learn the Quran and learn revelation and learn about the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happened? He learned so much. He became known as a person who knew more of the Quran than others in his age group. What a powerful youngster. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us and our youth from those who are keen on learning and from those who fight laziness. Today, one of the biggest hobbies that a lot of the youth have is to sleep. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. May Allah grant us ease and goodness. Every moment we waste, Wallahi, we have thrown it aside. May Allah make us from amongst those who realize and understand that while sleep is important, too much of it is actually not only detrimental to our health, but even to our spirituality and our link with Allah and our preparation for the day that we meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now he starts coming to the halaqahs regularly, secretly. He doesn't want people to find out because to find out in Makkah would be a big problem. Especially with his mother, Khunnas bint Malik. His mother was a very powerful woman. She had, a, she had a very controlling personality. He wasn't afraid of anybody else except his mother. Didn't want to mess with his mom, like many of us. Right? We, you can take on anybody, but you can't get on mom's bad side. So he's sneaking in, and one of the one of the kuffar they saw he saw him, and word spread, and finally got to his mother. So they called a town meeting from his tribe. They pulled him in. They said, "Is this true? You become a Muslim? Somebody seen you pray like Muhammad prays, and we saw you go into Darul Arqam. What's going on?" He said, "Yes, I become Muslim." I, what can I say? He accepted, he acknowledged. His mother's first reaction was to try to spear him. She was that mad. Then to hit him, but she couldn't do it. She loved him too much. So what she decided to do was she tied him up and she put him in the corner of the house with guards watching him the whole day. For days. Many, many days. He stayed in his house, just not even being able to scratch himself, just tied up. Because he had accepted Islam. Weeks pass on by and finally whisperings about a migration happen that the Muslims are going to escape all this torture, all this harassment, they're going to get away. So Mus'ab bin Umar, he waits for a moment that is right. He waits until the guard that is watching him falls asleep, takes a break, takes some rest, and he gets his wrists out of the handcuffs. He takes his hands out of the rope and he runs and he migrates to Abyssinia with the rest of the believers that went. While he was there, there was rumor that Mecca was now friendly to the Muslims, so he came back. But that rumor ended up being false. And he meets with his mother at this time. This is months, years later. And his mother says, Mus'ad, my son, come back to our way. Come back to your family. Come back to the, the way of your forefathers, your grandparents. Don't embarrass us. And he says, my mother, I cannot. He says, my relationship with Allah it means more to me than anything that you can give me. And she says, if this is the case, she says, then these clothes that you're wearing, this money that you have, this wealth that you're benefiting from, kiss it goodbye. It's done. You're not gonna take it anymore. Now I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine somebody that has grown up nearly 20 years, never knowing anything but being rich. Never having any experiences, but that every single thing in their life was paid for. You know, when he used to walk in the streets of Mecca, they said that his clothes would drag behind him by several feet. Why? If you and I did that, you would say, brother, clean up, pick up your cloth. You don't want to, you don't want to ruin the garment. Well, he didn't care about ruining his garments because he would just buy another one. That's how wealthy he was. I want you to imagine that at the height of this moment, the climax, his mother is telling him that this life that you're benefiting from, you're enjoying, it's gone if you don't give up this message of La ilaha illallah. 
any of us in that moment, subhanAllah, we may not give up la ilaha illallah, inshallah we would stay firm, but we might try to make a deal. Like, can I get the credit card on Mondays and Wednesdays? And then you take it back on Tuesdays and Thursdays? Like, can we come up, can you just lower my allowance by 50%? Right, can we just agree? We, because the attachment to wealth is so addictive. But Mus'ab bin Umair, those shackles had been broken. Why? Because he had committed full time. And if you look at the life of the companions, you find that what made them great, the reason why we name our kids after them, the reason why we study them in Sunday school is because they were people of sacrifice. And when you look at the life of Mus'ab bin Umair, you see that he is about to make one of the biggest sacrifices in his life because you know what? Great things only happen when sacrifice is involved. If you want to live a life of mediocrity, then go ahead and don't sacrifice anything. But if you and your community want to make great strides and changes and transformations in the world as we know it, then sacrifice is demanded. That is the cost. And so Mus'ab bin Umair, he knows this. And if you look at the honor the Prophet ﷺ gives him at the end of his life, in the middle and the end of his life, you'll see that this sacrifice, he saw that coming. So he tells his mother, Ya Ummi, I will not give it up. Take all your wealth. And she says, I'm going to lock you up again. Because you know sometimes when, when people are trying to scare you and nothing ends up working, they start threatening physical punishment again. I'm going to lock you up. He says, I swear to God, if you lock me up, the guy that you pick, we're going to be praying Janazah on him tomorrow. Whatever guard you want to guard me, He's not going to live longer than 24 hours. And she's taken aback. She didn't expect this from her son. Because the believer has some izzah. At the same time, they have hikmah, they have honor. They don't get stepped on, but they also don't fight back ruthlessly. They're in between. They have wisdom with honor. And he says, don't lock me up. Listen, I'm not hurting you. You don't hurt me. Let's call it fair. She says, fine, go. He's leaving his house, his uncle stops him. He says, you know these clothes you're wearing right now, they're from your uncle. They're from your father, your late father. So they don't belong to you either. Take them off if you want to stay with Islam. He, the man who everybody looked to for fashion standards, the guy who was like, you know, this, the, the, the most handsome man, the most respected young man in the society, had to leave his house covering his shame with his hands. He had to leave his house naked. This is the state of Musa bin Umayr. Comes to Rasulullah, gets some, you know, some garb to wear, and now he starts, you know, and totally commits himself to the task of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, learning the Quran constantly. He's sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, learning and memorizing the Quran, and he was one of the most beautiful reciters of the Quran. So Musa ibn Umair radiyallahu an, when it came to the pledge of allegiance in Aqaba, when the first group of people came from Medina and met Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Mina. Just prior to the Hijrah, approximately one year and a few months prior to the Hijrah, the first group of people that came, they had pledged allegiance with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Medina Munawwara in Mina. And what happened is, when they left, they sent a message to say, we want you to send someone who knows the deen and the religion, and who knows revelation, who knows some rules and regulations to come to Medina and to teach us the faith and to keep us on the path. So the Prophet ﷺ chose the one who knew the most at the time, the one who was most befitting for that particular task. The first ambassador of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever, Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu was sent to al Madinah al munawwara And he was the first who went. His mission was to teach them goodness and to be a person who taught them revelation and what was right and wrong in terms of the deen. When he arrived there, As'ad ibn Zurara radiallahu anhu, who had accepted Islam in that pledge of allegiance in Aqaba, the first time he was the one who kept Mus'ab ibn Umayr and hosted him. One of the chiefs heard about this, he got really mad. One day Musab was sitting outside in public giving the dars, teaching Quran. And he came with a spear and said, you better stop talking to my tribe or I will kill you. And Musab, young man, if anybody else comes up to us, you're holding an MSA meeting, some guy walks in here. You Muslims better stop this or I'm going to take care of you outside in the parking lot. Right? Oh, he's like, oh yeah, bring it on. You know, this is what we would do. You know what he says, Musab bin Umayr? He looks at this guy threatening him. And he says, well, why don't you listen to what I have to say? If you accept it, well and good. If you reject it, I'll stop bothering you. He says, sounds fair. Put his spear, stuck it in the ground. He sat down. 
and Musab ibn Umair start reciting the Quran very calmly. And the man heard it and he said, This is the truth. How can I enter this religion? And he became a Muslim. And then he said, Oh, wait a second. I know a man, if he accepts, then his whole tribe will accept. Let me get him for you. And he went and got him too. And before this happened, incidentally, this was a chief of a tribe, right? He comes to Musab ibn Umair and said, What can I do to enter this religion? Musab said, You have to go take a shower first and wear clean clothes. Then come back. So he goes, takes a shower, comes back, and then Musab ibn Umair takes a shahada from him, and then from the other tribes, and huge chunks you know, of, of Medinan tribes start coming into Islam. So Musab ibn Umair was the, the, the trendsetter for history. What we have now, what the Rasul had as a refuge in Medina, was the work of Allah through Musab ibn Umair. This youth who decided to give up his wealth. In Medina, when the Prophet came, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, one time he was giving a, a, a khutbah, a dars, and Musab ibn Umair came and sat in the majlis. And a lot of people looked at him from Makkah, the, the ones that knew him. They looked at him and they looked down like this in shame. And a lot of them started crying. You know why? Because he was wearing a torn blanket. This was the man they remembered wearing brand name clothes and you know amazingly dressed. Nobody dressed as good as he did. Now he's wearing all of this only because he decides he's going to sacrifice all of his preferences for the sake of Allah. So some Sahaba even started crying. And, Musab, and Muhammad sallallahu even looked at him and said, I remember you, you used to be very, very well dressed. Your family used to dress you well. They used to feed you well. And then the Prophet sallallahu advised and, and actually congratulated the believers that Allah will give them kingship of when they will have different clothes to wear in the day and different clothes to wear in the night. And the Sahaba said, will we be better off then? And the Prophet said, no, you're better off now. You're better off right now when you don't have anything. Because then the love of dunya, what the Prophet meant, the love of dunya will enter into your hearts. In any case, Mus'ab ibn Umayr, at the battle of Badr, his brother is captivated. He's one of the prisoners with the Muslims. The Rasul sallallahu said, take good care of the prisoners. So his brother is prisoner and the Sahaba, they're eating food, they're eating rice and they're drinking water and they're giving the same amount of rice and water to him. Mus'ab ibn Umayr walks by and he looks at his brother and he says to the guard, My brother, tie this kafir up tightly because his mother is rich, she'll probably give a good ransom to us. And his brother looks at him like, You're not talking to him, are you? You're talking to me, right? He goes, No, no, you're not my brother. That's my brother. His iman was such that he understood just like Nuh was made to understand. Those who are not in the boat are not your family. Those who fight against this deen, they're not your family. Those who believe with you, those who have iman and engage in righteous deeds, we will enter them into a new affiliation, a new family of the righteous. You've been indoctrinated into a new family. Those who struggle with you in the way of this deen. So this was the character of Musab ibn Umayr. In the battle of Uhud, we find the greatest sacrifice that he made. Because his life was littered with sacrifices. It was sprinkled with sa Everywhere you look in his life, he had given something up. Which shows us that it's not just going to be one time. It's going to have to be a personality disposition. So he's in Uhud. And for those of you who do know or don't know, Uhud was a time that was very difficult for the believers. Because they, the archers, the young archers, had not listened to the Prophet Muhammad When he told them, do not chase this war, spoils, money, don't come after it. He said, I need you to stay up on top of this mountain. And it, no matter what's happening, if you see the birds eating our bodies, don't come off of this mountain. You are our last protection. And in Uhud, it looked like the believers had won. At one point, it looked like the Muslims had triumphed, had succeeded. And all of a sudden, these archers saw all the believers going and chasing these spoils of war, this money, all the armor and the gold and everything. And they became incensed with the love of wealth. They wanted it. They wanted to get part of that. They wanted everything that Musa bin Umair had left behind. And at this point, this is when all damage broke loose. Khalid bin Walid, who was not Muslim at the time, he led a, a resurgence, a second attack around the back of the mountain. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was attacked to the point where his helmet dug into his cheeks. And there were companions that had to jump in front of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to take arrows that were flying at him. And there were even rumors swirling in the battle that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had died. And Musa bin Omer, he sees this happening. And he has the flag 
that has the kalima on it to represent the side of the believers. He has that in his hands and he sees the Prophet ﷺ is being attacked. So he starts yelling takbir and he starts calling out these chants to draw the attention away from the army that's attacking the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and he takes his horse and he rides as fast as he can and he curves to take the army away from the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. And it works, the plan that he has, it works because they draw away from the attacking the Prophet Muhammad but now they know and he knows that he's gone. In that moment, he had to make a split decision. Who do I love more? Myself or the Messenger of Allah? You know, the decisions that we, don't, we have to make, they don't demand us to give our life. We're not sitting in a battlefield saying, who do I love more, the Prophet or myself? We're sitting in bed at Fajr time. Who do I love more? Allah and His Messenger or myself? We're sitting at work when we know that there's decisions that might be unethical. We're sitting and watching something that might be destroying our heart. Material on the television or on the computer that might be eating us alive. And the question we have to ask ourselves, we don't have to go and throw our bodies into the battlefield. We don't have to do that. We just have to say at this moment, who do I love more? Allah and His Messenger or my own self? And the Prophet Muhammad said, none of you will believe until I, I am more beloved to them than their own selves. So Musa bin Omer, he runs and he takes his horse and he knows that this is it. He knows that he's going to be trampled. He knows that he's running into an army where he is one and there's 70, 80, 90 people about to attack him. But he wants to make sure that he holds that flag of Islam high. And so one person on the other side of the side of the Quraysh he targets the hand that he sees because this is a, a symbol of strength. The flag being up in the air is a symbol of strength. That the Muslims are still strong. So he takes his sword and he takes the arm that's holding the flag and he cuts that arm and he chops it off. And Musa bin Omer, before the flag can even tumble to the ground, he drops his sword from his other hand and grabs the flag and keeps it in the air and says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا, وما محمد إلا رسول قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ he says, and Muhammad is but a messenger. Other messengers before him were also killed. And the same man who cut his right arm then cuts his left. So the flag begins to fall and he grabs it now with whatever he has left of his arms and holds it to his chest. And he says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا, وما محمد إلا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسول. He says that Muhammad is but a messenger and other messengers were killed before him. And then he gets swarmed by the rest of the people and they said that at the time of his death, there were over 70 sword and speared wounds on his body. That was the answer to his question, who do I love more? Allah's messenger or myself? And then afterwards, afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored what was in his heart. And he put this ayah in Surah Ali Imran in the description of the battle of Uhud. You find this ayah, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ Muhammad is nothing except a messenger. Messengers came before him too. If in case he died, or if he got killed, and qalabtum ala a'qabikum, are you going to turn back on your heels? The one who turns back on his heels, he could not harm Allah in anything. And Allah will soon reward the shakirin, those who are grateful. When Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa looked at the body of Umayyad, you know the, the shuhada were being given salams on the battlefield. These young men were give, being given salams by the, the, because the Prophet sallallahu had instructed us, even to this day, that we're supposed to say salam on the shuhada. For they respond to the salams according to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the, the, the sahaba that survived the battle, they're going around giving salams to the shuhada. They got to the body of Musa bin Umayyad and all of them started crying. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa saw his body, you know what he said? He said, فَمِنْهُمْ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ They are from, this is an ayah of the Qur'an that he recited when he looked at him. You know, we can recite these ayahs. But when these ayahs were recited by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was something else. He said, from among the believers are real men that have already confirmed their covenant that it was made with them. That Allah had made with them. Then from among them are those who have given their due. And from among them are those who are still waiting to give their due. And they would not re replace their desire to give their due, to give their whole life to Allah with anything else. 
they would not replace it for anything. This is the ayah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam recited upon the body of Muslim ibn Umar. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the companions after the battle was over, he came to bury the Muslimin, the Mujahideen, the Shuhada. And then when they looked at Mus'ab ibn Umair, they searched through his wealth and he did not find anything with his wealth to cover him. All they could find in his house was a piece of cloth to wrap him up in, the kafan. And when they would cover his head, his feet would show. And when they would cover his feet, his head would show. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, Wallahi, there was a time when I did not know a person who had a more luxurious life than this man. And today, out of his love of Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and this deen of his, he has sacrificed in a way that he has nothing to even cover his body after he has been martyred. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Bakhim bakh ya Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Oh Mus'ab ibn Umayr. We did not find anything of the wealth just to cover your whole body and bury you in. You donated it all for those who were in need. In Jannah is where we shall meet. Al-Firdaus Al-A'la, my dear brothers and sisters.